Maternal, fetal, and neonatal effects. With a few important exceptions, the effects of GDM are similar to those associated with pre-existing diabetes. The exceptions are that GDM is not associated with an increased risk for maternal ketoacidosis or spontaneous abortion, and there is a decreased chance of pre-existing maternal vascular and organ damage associated with diabetes. Because GDM develops after the first trimester, the critical period of major fetal organ development, organogenesis, it usually is not associated with an increase in major congenital malformations. Nevertheless, poorly controlled GDM, characterized by maternal hyperglycemia during the third trimester, is associated with increased neonatal morbidity and mortality. The major fetal complications are macrosomia, leading to birth injuries or cesarean birth, and neonatal hypoglycemia. Other problems such as hypocalcemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and respiratory distress also may occur. Therapeutic management, diet. Ideally, an RD, RDT, or diabetes educator determines the dietary needs of the woman with GDM. The diet should provide the calories and nutrients needed for maternal and fetal health, result in euglycemia, avoid ketosis, and promote appropriate weight gain. Calories should be distributed in a way similar to for pre-existing diabetes. Simple sugars found in concentrated sweets should be eliminated from the diet. Based on a non-obese pre-pregnancy weight, an average of 30 to 35 kcal per kilogram per day is recommended. Calorie restriction to 25 kcal per kilogram each day may be recommended for women who are obese. These women may be prescribed a diet with a smaller percentage of carbohydrates than for women of normal weight to limit hyperglycemia. Carbohydrates at breakfast may be limited to 30 grams during pregnancy because of increased levels of cortisol and growth hormones at that time of day. Protein foods at breakfast help satisfy early morning hunger. An evening snack is usually needed to prevent ketosis at night. Calories should be divided among three meals and two to four snacks. Exercise. Research results have been mixed about whether exercise reduces the need for insulin in the woman with GDM. Nevertheless, exercise and an active lifestyle can improve cardiorespiratory fitness. A graduated physical exercise program should be recommended by a physician, taking into account each woman's risk factors as part of the treatment plan for women with GDM. Blood glucose monitoring. Blood glucose levels should be evaluated to determine whether levels are normal. A common method is measurement of fasting blood glucose level, no food for the previous four hours, and postprandial blood glucose level, one or two hours after each meal. Frequency of glucose monitoring may be modified once the glucose levels are well controlled by diet. If fasting capillary blood glucose levels repeatedly exceed 95 milligrams per deciliter or postprandial values exceed 140 milligrams per deciliter at one hour or 120 milligrams per deciliter at two hours, pharmacologic therapy may be added. Additional tests for glucose levels may be performed as needed. Pharmacologic treatment. Pharmacologic treatment may be required for some women with GDM when diet and exercise do not achieve glycemic targets. Insulin is the preferred medication for treatment of hyperglycemia in GDM. Insulin is typically started at 0.7 to 1 unit per kilogram per day, given in divided doses. Intermediate acting and short acting insulin may be used alone or in combination. Dosage should be adjusted to the woman's blood glucose levels at particular times of the day. 
Although insulin remains the only drug widely accepted for treatment of diabetes during pregnancy because it does not cross the placenta, oral agents are being studied more closely for GDM treatment. ACOG recognizes that either insulin or oral agents may be used as an appropriate first-line pharmacologic therapy in GDM. Gliburide, micronase, and metformin, glucophage, have been studied for use with GDM and have demonstrated glucose control comparable to insulin without apparent maternal or neonatal complications. Because further research is needed on the long-term outcomes of oral diabetic therapy with GDM, ACOG recommends patient counseling with this treatment plan. Fetal surveillance. Testing to identify fetal compromise may be of benefit for women with GDM and poor glycemic control, but there is no consensus regarding antepartum fetal testing for women with GDM and good glycemic control. Testing may begin as early as 28 weeks of gestation if the woman has poor glycemic control or by 32 to 34 weeks of gestation in lower risk women with GDM. The surveillance testing often includes kick counts, ultrasonography for fetal growth and amniotic fluid volume, BPP, NSTs, contraction stress test, or amniocentesis for fetal lung maturity. Nursing considerations. The care of a pregnant woman with diabetes mellitus focuses primarily on maintaining normal blood glucose levels. As stated earlier, this maintenance involves a rather rigid schedule of controlling a diet, performing blood glucose tests, administering insulin, and performing regular fetal surveillance. Some women respond calmly to the intense medical supervision. Others respond with anxiety, fear, denial, or anger and may feel inadequate or unable to control the diabetes to the degree expected by the healthcare team. These feelings may not be shared spontaneously, but they may affect the woman's ability to achieve the desired outcomes. Also, nurses should remember to provide for normal pregnancy care in addition to monitoring the pregnant woman's diabetes. Increasing effective communication. A woman often does not volunteer information about her feelings and concerns, especially if she has negative feelings about her care. In addition, the woman and the nurse both may be unaware of any misunderstanding or conflict regarding the plan of care. Nurses should ask specifically about the feelings and concerns the woman and her family have about the pregnancy. Broad opening questions such as what are your major concerns and how do you feel about the plan of care are helpful. These should be followed by more specific questions such as how do you feel about the fetal testing and what would you like to change about the diet. The woman's responses may provide valuable information about her emotional response to the care plan. One woman remarked, I can tell you one thing, I don't feel like a person. I feel like an incubator, a faulty incubator. Another woman who had a difficult time achieving the desired blood glucose level said, I feel as though my whole life has been taken over by diabetes. I'm tired of feeling like a sick person. The nurse should be an active listener and allow time for the woman and her family to express concerns and feelings. The nurse should convey acceptance of both negative feelings and positive feelings that are expressed. Many women are reassured to hear that their feelings of stress or anger are normal and learn that the healthcare team understands those feelings. Sharing of emotions will help her avoid or diminish unnecessary guilt, anxiety, and frustration, and thus promotes positive feelings about her ability to participate successfully in her plan of care. Most women benefit from praise when diabetes control is well-maintained. They feel competent and trusted by the healthcare team and are motivated to continue their efforts. Providing opportunities for control. Allowing the woman to make as many decisions as possible increases her sense of being in control. For instance, she can select foods from the exchange list that provide the necessary nutrients but still allow her some choice. 
A dietitian or dietary technician should be consulted if the list does not include foods she likes or that suit her ethnic or cultural preference. A regular schedule of exercise and sleep that helps keep the blood glucose level under control is important. The woman can develop the schedule for rest and exercise that best suits her lifestyle. Nurses should allow as much flexibility as possible when scheduling stressful events such as fetal monitoring tests and amniocentesis. Some women resent being treated as though ill, even though their diabetes control is excellent. These women may be capable of making more decisions regarding their care during pregnancy, but they need the support of an understanding team to do this. Providing normal pregnancy care. Some women express a need for more attention to the normal aspects of their pregnancies. This can be overlooked because of the intense focus on preventing complications that can occur with diabetes. Women with diabetes also experience discomforts, such as morning sickness, fatigue, backache, and difficulty sleeping that women without diabetes experience during pregnancy. The nurse caring for women with diabetes should therefore provide the usual education and counseling regarding pregnancy. Application of the nursing process, the pregnant woman with diabetes mellitus. Assessment. Determine how well the woman understands the prescribed management and how the family plans to carry out the recommended regimen. She may be newly diagnosed and have no experience in the necessary skills and procedures. The woman who had diabetes before becoming pregnant may be skilled in the monitoring glucose level and administering insulin. However, the woman with pre-existing diabetes may have no knowledge of how diabetes can affect pregnancy or how pregnancy can affect diabetes. She may have been using pre-mixed insulin exclusively and now must begin mixing insulins of different types. A woman with type 2 diabetes may have taken only oral medication and now must learn to mix and inject insulin. To determine whether the pregnant woman's techniques are accurate, ask her to demonstrate how she monitors blood glucose level and observe as she mixes and injects insulins if she has done that. Verify that she and her family are aware of the need to select appropriate sites and injection techniques that prevent insulin leakage. Although diet is prescribed by a dietitian or diabetes educator, the nurse should assess how well the family understands the diet, determine whether special problems with food preferences or availability of recommended food exists. Diet recommendations include a target number of calories plus targets for grams of carbohydrate, protein, and fat to meet calorie needs. Any of the several methods to count and exchange foods may be used. One method uses exchange lists in which the listed foods all have about the same number of grams of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Therefore, one food from the list may be substituted or exchanged for another in the same list. Another method uses carbohydrate counting in which foods on the starch, fruit, or milk list supply about 15 grams of carbohydrate or one carbohydrate choice. The diet plan would prescribe the number of carbohydrate choices for each meal and snack. Insulin is often adjusted according to the carbohydrate count for each meal or snack. Identify special needs related to food preferences, culturally prescribed foods, or the availability of recommended foods. It may be necessary to review an exchange list and ask the woman how she plans to substitute and exchange foods to obtain the prescribed number of foods from each list. Identify the woman's knowledge of potential complications such as hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia so that she and her family can be provided with pertinent information to avoid it and treat it. Determine her knowledge of fetal surveillance techniques and her response to the need for frequent tests. Some women are highly motivated to continue the treatment regimen when test results indicate that the fetus is thriving. Other women find the frequent testing stressful and inconvenient. Identification of patient problems. A common patient problem for women with diabetes during pregnancy is need for patient teaching of one, measures to maintain normal blood glucose levels, two, measures to manage abnormal blood glucose levels, and three, 
Common fetal surveillance procedures. Planning. Expected outcomes. Goals for this problem are that the woman and her family will do the following. Demonstrate competence in SMBG level and administration of insulin before home management is initiated. Describe a plan for meeting dietary recommendations that fit family lifestyle and food preferences. Identify signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia and the management required for each. Verbalize knowledge of fetal surveillance procedures and keep scheduled appointments for testing. Interventions. Management of diabetes mellitus during pregnancy is a team effort and the nurse is responsible to provide or reinforce accurate information about the therapeutic regimen and offer consistent support for the woman's efforts to comply with the recommendations. It may be necessary to demonstrate specific skills that the woman and her support person should master and to review and reinforce information from other members of the healthcare team. Teaching self-care skills. Demonstrations and return demonstrations are effective ways to teach and evaluate psychomotor skills. The woman and her family should learn to, one, use a meter and obtain a small sample of blood, two, test for glucose level, and three, mix and inject insulin. The procedures are invasive and cause mild discomfort, which may make the woman reluctant to start. Mixing insulins accurately or using a sliding scale may be intimidating at first. Using food exchanges is often unfamiliar to the woman who is newly diagnosed, but it is critical to glucose control. Acknowledge these feelings before teaching begins. Self-monitoring of blood glucose level. Spring-loaded lancets make home blood glucose monitoring easier. The side of the fingertip is less sensitive than the pad of the fingertip, so using the side reduces discomfort. Teach the woman to cleanse the area with warm water before obtaining a sample to prevent infection. If alcohol is used to clean the area, let it dry thoroughly. The first drop of blood is wiped away, and the second drop is placed on a meter strip. Each home monitoring kit contains specific instructions for the use of the meter and the type of reagent strip or cartridge that should be used. Teach the woman how to record glucose values in a handwritten or other log. Teach her that current glucose monitors have a memory option to provide retrieval of previous glucose readings. Insulin administration. The woman is often prescribed a combination of short-acting and intermediate-acting insulins. Teach her about the difference in onset peak and duration of action of each type of insulin in her combination. She also needs to learn how to mix the two insulins in the same syringe. If she will use a sliding scale to keep glucose levels close to normal, she will need teaching about how to determine the additional dose of insulin if she has never used a sliding scale for insulin administration. Insulin is administered subcutaneously. Common sites include the upper thighs, abdomen, and upper arms. Because the pregnant woman is injecting insulin frequently, emphasize the following precautions. To prevent hypoglycemia, a meal should be taken 30 minutes after regular insulin is injected. Because of its 10-minute onset of action, Lispro, Humaloc, insulin, is injected just before eating. Unless the woman is very thin, Insulin should be injected with the short needle inserted at a 90 degree angle so that the tip of the needle reaches the fatty tissue layer. The needle should be inserted quickly to minimize discomfort. The tissue pinch, if used, is released after inserting the needle and before injecting insulin because pressure from the pinch can promote insulin leakage from subcutaneous tissue. Aspirating is not necessary when injecting into subcutaneous tissue. Insulin is injected slowly over two to four seconds to allow tissue expansion and minimize pressure, which can cause insulin leakage. The needle is withdrawn quickly to minimize the formation of a track, which might cause insulin to leak out. Emphasize the importance of administering the correct dosage at the correct time. Teach the woman and her family about the function of insulin 
and the importance of following the directions of her physician in regard to coordinating meals with the administration of insulin. Continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. Many women who have pre-existing diabetes use continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion and wish to continue with this method during pregnancy. The use of programmable insulin infusion pumps allows tailoring of insulin administration to the woman's individual lifestyle. Prompt emergency counseling and assistance should be available 24 hours a day to deal with unexpected problems such as pump malfunction. Teaching dietary management. Although a dietitian prescribes the recommended diet, the nurse should be aware of the general requirements and be sensitive to the woman's dietary habits and preferences. Often reviewing and clarifying how exchange lists are used to plan meals and snacks are necessary. Encourage the patient to avoid simple sugars, candy, cake, and cookies, which raise the blood glucose levels quickly but may result in wide swings between high and low glucose levels. It may be necessary to help the woman select foods that are high in nutrients but low in cost or meet cultural or religious constraints. Animal protein is especially expensive, and alternative sources of protein, beans, peas, corn, and grains, can be substituted to meet some of the protein needs, as well as provide high-quality carbohydrate and fiber. A nutrition and dietetic technician, NDTR, can help a pregnant woman who is a vegetarian meet her individual needs, depending on what foods are acceptable to her. Allow the expectant mother to verbalize her frustrations or problems with the diet and collaborate with the dietitian if she has a particular problem. Managing hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Every woman and her family should be aware of signs and symptoms that indicate abnormal glucose levels and how to correct the abnormal levels. Hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia pose a threat to the mother and the fetus if these problems are not identified and corrected quickly. Hypoglycemia. Treat hypoglycemia at once to prevent damage to the fetal brain, which depends on glucose. The woman should take 15 grams of carbohydrate if she can swallow food. Examples of foods that supply this are three glucose tablets or glucose gel half a cup of fruit juice or regular soft drink, six saltine crackers, or one tablespoon of syrup or honey. Large quantities of high-carbohydrate foods such as candy will increase the blood glucose excessively, making a sudden fall in the level more likely. The woman should retest 15 minutes after the carbohydrate intake and repeat the treatment if her blood glucose level remains below 70 milligrams per deciliter. If it is more than one hour until the next meal or snack, test again 60 minutes after treatment. Additional carbohydrate may be required. Teach family members how to inject glucagon in the event that the woman cannot swallow or retain food. Notify the physician at once. IV glucose will be administered if she is hospitalized. If untreated, hypoglycemia can progress to seizures and death. To prevent hypoglycemia, instruct the woman to have meals at a fixed time each day and to plan snacks at 10 a.m., 3 p.m., and bedtime. Suggest that she always carry glucose tablets or gel or some crackers with her. Hyperglycemia. Because infection is the most common cause of hyperglycemia, Pregnant women should be instructed to notify the physician whenever they have an infection of any type. Untreated hyperglycemia can lead to ketoacidosis, coma, and maternal and fetal death. If signs and symptoms occur, notify the physician at once the treatment can be initiated. Hospitalization often is necessary to monitor blood glucose levels for IV insulin administration to normalize glucose levels and for treatment of any underlying infection. Explaining procedures, tests, and plan of care. Explain the schedule and the reasons for frequent checkups and necessary tests. Encourage the woman and her family to ask questions if any part of the schedule is confusing. 
This is particularly important for women who are aware that their prenatal care differs significantly from that of their friends who do not have diabetes. Knowing that the tests provide information about the condition of the mother and the fetus reduces frustration and anxiety. Explain why more frequent antepartum surveillance testing is needed when diabetes complicates pregnancy. The woman needs to know her diabetic care will require more time and effort than it did before pregnancy, but that this care greatly improves her likelihood of having a healthy infant. Evaluation. After procedures, tests, and plan of care have been explained, evaluation should ensure the following. The woman and at least one support person can demonstrate competence in home glucose monitoring and administration of insulin. The woman can describe a satisfactory plan for meeting her individual dietary requirements. The woman and at least one support person can list the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia and describe the initial management of these conditions. The woman can verbalize knowledge of the reason for fetal surveillance procedures and keep appointments for tests. Cardiac disease. During pregnancy, significant hemodynamic adaptations occur to support maternal and fetal metabolic demands. These changes begin soon after conception and continue as gestation advances and are almost totally reversed within weeks to months after delivery. These cardiovascular adaptations can be problematic for the woman with cardiac disease. Such changes include increased blood volume, decreased systemic vascular resistance, increased clot formation, and increase in heart rate and cardiac output starting as early as five weeks of pregnancy. Stroke volume is the primary reason cardiac output increases in early pregnancy, whereas in late pregnancy, stroke volume decreases and heart rate increases, maintaining the elevation in cardiac output. A normal heart can adapt to the changes so pregnancy and birth are tolerated without difficulty. For women with pre-existing or underlying heart disease, however, the changes can impose an additional burden on an already compromised heart, which may result in cardiac decompensation leading to an ischemic event or congestive heart failure. CHF, failure of heart to maintain adequate circulation. Incidence and classification. Heart disease complicates 1% to 4% of pregnancies. The overall incidence of congenital heart disease, CHD, is increasing by 5% each year, which consequently increases the morbidity associated with cardiac disease in pregnant women. Heart disease is now the leading cause of indirect maternal death, meaning death from a pre-existing disease exacerbated by physiologic changes of pregnancy. Pregnancy may unmask a previously asymptomatic heart condition, or it may aggravate known heart disease. In some cases, pregnancy is contraindicated because of the severity of the mortality risk to the mother. There are two major categories of heart disease, acquired and congenital. Acquired disease develops after birth and congenital disease is present at birth. Previously, acquired disease was the most prevalent form of heart disease because of increased incidence of rheumatic fever. Medical advances have made rheumatic fever uncommon leaving CHD as the most common form in North America. Women with CHD are now likely to survive to reproductive age, adding cardiac risk to their pregnancy. Cardiac disease effect on pregnancy depends on the woman's response to the hemodynamic changes and the severity of her disease. Acquired heart disease, rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease is a complication that sometimes follows streptococcal pharyngitis, strep throat. Even one case of rheumatic fever may cause scarring of the heart valves, resulting in stenosis, narrowing, of the openings between the chambers of the heart. Early diagnosis and treatment of the streptococcal infection has resulted in a near eradication of rheumatic fever in North America and Western Europe. The mitral valve, is the most common site of stenosis. Mitral stenosis obstructs free blood flow 
from the left atrium to the left ventricle. The left atrium becomes dilated, and as a result, pressure in the left atrium, pulmonary veins, and pulmonary capillaries is chronically elevated. This elevation may lead to pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema, aortic regurgitation, atrial fibrillation, or congestive heart failure. The first warnings of heart failure include persistent crackles at the base of the lungs, dyspnea on exertion, cough, and hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood. Progressive edema and tachycardia are additional signs of heart failure. Valvular stenosis. Valvular stenosis is most commonly caused by infection or blockage of the heart. Rheumatic fever and endocarditis are common infections that cause narrowing of heart valves. Some types of stenosis should be surgically repaired before pregnancy is attempted. Unrepaired stenotic valves may not tolerate the increased blood volume and cardiac output changes of pregnancy. Because of the increased risk for clot formation with valve replacement, anticoagulation is required. Bacterial endocarditis carries a high mortality risk for valvular heart disease and therefore should be treated in labor. Myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction, MI, affects 1 in 10,000 pregnancies with the highest incidence in the third trimester. Maternal mortality rates at the time of the event are about 20%. Neonatal mortality is approximately 15%. Risk factors associated with increased incidence of MI include smoking, hyperlipidemia, increased LDL or decreased HDL, Family history of MI, previously existing cardiovascular disease, hypertension and diabetes, advanced maternal age. Common symptoms noted are radiating substernal chest pain, diaphoresis, nausea, and exertional dyspnea, although some women with coronary artery disease remain asymptomatic. In a study reviewing symptoms of different age groups of women, Devon, Petty, Vukovic, Koenig, and McSweeney, 2016, found that women 65 years old or older had less chest pain and more difficulty breathing compared with women younger than 65 years old. Delivery should be delayed, if possible, for two weeks after an event because mortality rates exponentially increase if delivery occurs in the following 14 days. Following an MI, it is important to focus on supporting maternal heart function. Labor management should include lateral positioning, left or right, to maintain stable cardiac output during labor, effective pain and anxiety management, epidural, to decrease maternal oxygen consumption, second stage labor management to include laboring down and avoiding the Valsalva maneuver, through use of vacuum or forceps, antibiotic prophylaxis to decrease the risk for subacute bacterial endocarditis. Cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy is a rare and often fatal disorder of the muscle structure of the heart and may be considered a diagnosis of exclusion. Definition for diagnosis of exclusion is basically a diagnosis which is reached by process of elimination. Although a number of cardiomyopathy forms exist, this chapter is focusing on peripartum cardiomyopathy, PPCM. This form occurs from late pregnancy to five months postpartum with no identifiable cause and no known previous heart disease. Left ventricular dysfunction is demonstrated by an ejection fraction less than 45%. PPCM is associated with advanced maternal age, African-American race, hypertension, multiple fetus pregnancies, obesity, and tocolytic use, and may have a familial genetic component. The symptoms of PPCM are those of CHF, dyspnea on exertion, persistent basilar crackles, nocturnal cough, edema, weakness, chest pain, and heart palpitations. 
CHF is the primary sequelae of PPCM and could be related to an underlying heart disease or a response to treatment. Approximately 40% to 50% of women with cardiomyopathy may have a partial recovery with persistent CHF or other cardiac dysfunction. PPCM often recurs with subsequent pregnancies, particularly in women who did not have complete recovery of their left ventricular function. The woman should be informed of this risk. Anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin, LMWH, to prevent clot formation is recommended when cardiac dysfunction is severe. Other medical therapy includes fluid restriction to reduce pulmonary edema. Treatment of CHF and other pathologic processes associated with cardiomyopathy and use of vasodilators, e.g. hydrazoline, or dopamine agonists, e.g. bromocryptine, to support cardiac function. Okay, so for this particular program, we've been instructed to skip over the next couple papers. We're skipping congenital, we're skipping shunts, diagnosis and classification of that, classes of heart disease, we're skipping drug therapy, and all that. We're going to go right to page 248, application of the nursing process, the pregnant woman with heart disease. Assessment. Begin with a review of the woman's medical record to determine the functional classification assigned, see box 10.4. Assess the woman at each prenatal appointment to determine how pregnancy affects the functional capacity of the heart. Take vital signs and compare them with preconception levels. Note any changes such as tachycardia since the previous prenatal appointment. Assess the level of fatigue and any changes in fatigue since the previous prenatal appointment. This is especially important when fluid volume peaks and the chance of cardiac decompensation is greatest, 18 to 32 weeks of gestation. Observe for signs or symptoms of CHF. Note additional factors that may increase the workload of the heart, anemia, infections, anxiety, lack of adequate support to manage the activities of daily living. Weigh the woman and compare the desired and actual patterns of weight gain to detect excessive weight gain or fluid retention. Assess the woman's knowledge of the prescribed regimen of care and her ability to comply with it. Identification of patient problems. The pregnant woman with a cardiac defect may be unable to tolerate activity to the same degree as before pregnancy because of the stress imposed on her cardiovascular system. Arriving at the patient problem, exhaustion, because of insufficient knowledge of measures that reduce cardiac stress, is a priority. Planning expected outcomes. Goals and outcomes are as follows. The woman and her family will identify factors that increase cardiac workload. The woman and family will describe measures that promote adaptation to activity restrictions. Interventions. Prenatal nursing care focuses on teaching the woman and her family about the possible effects of the disease on their lives. This teaching may include specific instructions about factors that increase the workload of the heart and measures to promote adaptation to activity restrictions during pregnancy and birth. Teaching also may reinforce or clarify the physician's instructions. Teaching about increased cardiac workload. Excessive weight gain and anemia. Excessive weight gain and anemia increase the workload of the heart just as they do in the non-pregnant state and should be avoided. A well-balanced diet with adequate high-quality protein and about 2,200 calories is recommended. Emphasize the importance of taking any prescribed iron supplements to prevent anemia and reduce the risk for tachycardia. Folic acid should be taken prior to conception to prevent anemia and reduce the risk for NTDs in the fetus. Exertion. Instruct the woman to modify her activity level to regulate energy expenditures and reduce cardiac workload. For example, 
she might take rest periods during the day and for an hour after meals. If possible, she should sit rather than stand when performing activities. She should rest every few minutes when performing an activity that increases heart rate to allow the heart time to recover. Emphasize that she should stop an activity if she experiences dyspnea, chest pain, or tachycardia. Exposure. Instruct the woman to avoid unnecessary exposure to environmental extremes. She should dress warmly during cold weather and create a barrier to cold temperatures by wearing layers of clothing. Educate her that exertion in hot, humid weather or during extreme cold weather places additional demands on the heart and should be avoided. Emotional stress. Explain the effects of emotional stress on the cardiovascular system, increased blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate. Help the woman identify areas of stress in her life. Discuss various methods for stress management such as meditation, progressive relaxation of muscles, and biofeedback. Teach that cigarette smoking and use of illicit drugs such as cocaine and amphetamines greatly increase stress on the heart and are associated with hypertension that further adds to cardiac workload and fetal compromise. Helping family accept restrictions on activity. Assist family members to accept the need for activity restriction. The amount of activity that the woman can tolerate depends on the severity of the disease. However, all women with heart disease need 8 to 10 hours of sleep each night, with periods of morning and afternoon rest. For some women, bed rest with bathroom privileges is necessary during the last half of pregnancy, and this may create special problems for the family. Nurses often help family members plan ways to meet their needs while the mother continues bed rest. So I looked that up and bed rest with bathroom privileges means you're ordered to stay in bed, but you are allowed to ambulate to use the toilet. Providing postpartum care. The woman is vulnerable in the postpartum period as interstitial fluid is mobilized into the vascular space for elimination. Continue to observe for signs of CHF. Observe urine output because it is a direct indicator of renal blood flow. Inadequate urine output may reflect the heart's inability to circulate blood adequately to the kidneys. After childbirth, the mother may be unable to assume care of the newborn, especially after a prolonged period of limited activity or bed rest. However, every effort should be made to promote contact between the mother and the baby. Many nurses assess the baby, perform the necessary newborn care at the bedside, and then allow the mother ample time to hold the infant. The father and other family members should be included in the care of the infant whenever possible. The decision about breastfeeding will be individualized according to the mother's condition and its demands on her energy. Regardless of feeding method, she should be encouraged to feed the infant whenever possible to promote maternal infant attachment. Consult with physicians and make referrals as necessary for follow-up care, which may include home care by a nurse or nursing assistant. Be certain that the family understands the signs and symptoms of cardiac complications and when to notify the physicians that problems have developed. Evaluation. The ability to identify the factors increasing cardiac workload offers reassurance that the woman and her family will initiate measures promoting adaptation to restricted activity. Obesity. Obesity is determined by one's BMI, defined as weight in kilograms, divided by height in meters squared. The World Health Organization organizes BMI into six categories, underweight, normal weight, overweight, and three classes of obesity, table 10.7. Waist circumference and weight to hip ratios are used to 
determine central or abdominal obesity. An abdominal waist circumference of 35 inches or more is defined as central obesity. Triggered. Obesity is a public health epidemic in the United States. The rate of obesity among all adults from 2011 to 2014 was 36.5%. Among young adults, 20 to 39 years old, it was 32.3%. Based on data from 2014, birth certificates from 47 states and the District of Columbia, 25.6% of the mothers were overweight. BMI is 25.0 to 29.9, and 24.8% were obese, BMI is greater than 29.9, before becoming pregnant. Increased rates of pre-pregnancy obesity were noted among non-Hispanic Black and non-Hispanic American Indian and Native Alaskan women. Increased maternal age, increased parity, three or more, and low socioeconomic status are associated with higher rates of pre-pregnancy obesity. Risk. Pregnancy can exacerbate obesity-related comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, and asthma. Obese women are less fertile and have an increased risk for spontaneous abortions and stillbirth compared to women of appropriate weight. During pregnancy, obesity significantly increases risks to the mother, fetus, and neonate. Maternal risks associated with obesity in pregnancy include gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, venous thromboembolism, cesarean delivery, wound infection, respiratory complications, preterm birth, birth trauma, and postpartum anemia. Infants of obese mothers have an increased risk of NTDs, hydrocephaly, and cardiovascular defect, as well as macrosomia, hypoglycemia, birth injury from shoulder dystocia, and neonatal intensive care admissions. Antenatal care. At the first prenatal visit, the woman's BMI should be determined. Obese pregnant women should be counseled on the risks associated with maternal obesity. An excessive weight gain during pregnancy is discussed at each prenatal visit. Proper nutrition to include a balanced diet caloric intake, exercise, and behavior modification. The recommended weight gain in pregnancy is 11 to 20 pounds in obese women, BMI 30 or greater, and 15 to 25 pounds in overweight women, BMI 25 to 29.9. The recommended amount of exercise for pregnant women is 20 to 30 minutes, preferably every day. Referral to a registered dietitian for development of a healthy eating plan may be appropriate. Because there is an association between obesity during pregnancy and psychological and emotional issues such as depression, anxiety, and stress, referral to a counselor or mental health provider may be reasonable. Overweight and obese women have an increased risk for undiagnosed type 2 diabetes mellitus. They should be screened at the first prenatal visit and again at 24 to 28 weeks gestation. Additional laboratory tests may include a baseline metabolic or chemistry panel if hypertension is noted. Obesity increases the risk for sleep apnea. If the obese pregnant patient has symptoms of snoring at night, sleepiness, or chronic fatigue, or cannot concentrate, a referral for a sleep study may be appropriate. Finally, an ultrasound should be obtained between 18 and 22 weeks to review fetal anatomy. Serial growth scans may be needed because of difficulty assessing fetal growth by funnel height measurements. Intrapartum care. Special equipment for the obese gravita may be necessary during labor and delivery. These include a bariatric bed, commode or toilet seat, extra large gowns, correct size blood pressure cuff, correct size sequential compression devices, bariatric wheelchairs, and a proper scale to weigh the patient. Should the patient require a C-section, a bariatric operating room table, as well as appropriate extra-long surgical instruments may be necessary. Nursing care during labor involves frequent assessment of the FHR and uterine activity monitoring. It may be necessary for one-to-one -one nursing care or two-to-one nursing care in some cases. It can be difficult to monitor the FHR externally and may require the use of internal monitoring for the FHR 
as well as intrauterine pressure monitoring to assess uterine contractions. Obese women are at increased risk for dysfunctional labor leading to cesarean birth. Analgesia and anesthesia may be difficult to achieve. Regional anesthesia is difficult because of the decreased ability to identify landmarks and inability to correctly position the patient. In women who have a cesarean birth, risks for surgical site infection and endometritis are increased. Higher doses of preoperative antibiotics may need to be required. A vertical skin incision may be performed and the physician may elect to involve a wound care nurse for follow-up. Postpartum. Obese mothers are at risk for pneumonia, infection, wound dehiscence, thromboembolism, and postpartum hemorrhage. Antibiotics may need to be continued during the postpartum period. Additionally, LMWH may be required to reduce the risk for thromboembolism. During the postpartum period, the nurse should encourage mothers to breastfeed their infants. Through breastfeeding, the obese will lose their pregnancy weight gain sooner than non-breastfeeding mothers. At the postpartum office appointment, gestational diabetes as well as hypertension should be reassessed. Finally, obese postpartum women should be encouraged to optimize their health during the interconception period. Pregnancy after bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery is a common treatment for obesity. Although it is not appropriate during pregnancy, some obese women may elect to have weight reduction surgery before conceiving. In these women, the rates of obstetrical complications are lower than in the morbidly obese patient. The woman should postpone pregnancy for 12 to 24 months after bariatric surgery to allow her weight to stabilize. She should be assessed for vitamin and nutritional deficiency and be monitored for signs of intestinal obstruction. Nursing considerations. It is important to recognize one's own biases when caring for obese patients and remember that weight can be a very sensitive topic for the patient. Plans and discussions concerning weight loss and management with childbearing patients should be handled with the utmost respect and sensitivity and should take a team-based, patient-centered approach. Although the obese pregnant patient faces significant health risks, with proper and consistent education and treatment, pregnant patients with obesity can experience healthy, successful pregnancies, lose weight, and improve their overall health and lifestyle. Anemias. Anemia is a condition in which a decline in circulating RBC mass reduces the capacity to carry oxygen to the vital organs of the mother or the fetus. Significant maternal anemia is associated with preterm birth and low birth weight. A pregnant woman is usually considered anemic if her hemoglobin level is less than 10.5 grams per deciliter in the second trimester or less than 11 grams per deciliter in the first and third trimesters. Anemia is one of the most common problems of pregnancy, affecting 15 to 25 percent of pregnant women. The incidence varies according to geographic location and socioeconomic group. Anemia may be caused by a variety of factors, including nutritional deficits, hemolysis, and blood loss. The most common type of anemia observed during pregnancy is iron deficiency anemia. Less common causes are folic acid deficiency, sickle cell disease, and thalassemia. So thalassemia from Google is an inherited blood disorder that causes your body to have less hemoglobin than normal. The increase in bariatric surgery has increased the number of women with vitamin B12 deficiency. Iron deficiency anemia. The total iron requirement for a typical pregnancy with a single fetus is approximately 1,000 milligrams. Unfortunately, most women of reproductive age do not have this amount of iron stores because of menstrual blood loss. Furthermore, meeting pregnancy needs by diet alone is difficult, although iron is present in many foods. Primary sources of iron are meat, fish, chicken, liver, and green leafy vegetables. Maternal effects. 
Signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia include pallor, fatigue, lethargy, and headache. Clinical findings also may include inflammation of the lips and tongue. Pica, consuming non-food substances such as clay, dirt, ice, and starch, may be a sign of iron deficiency anemia. Laboratory findings for iron deficiency anemia include RBCs that are microcytic, small, and hypochromic, pale. Plasma iron and serum ferritin levels are low, whereas the total iron binding capacity is higher than normal. Women who have multifetal pregnancies or bleeding complications are more likely to be anemic during pregnancy. Fetal and neonatal effects. All effects of maternal iron deficiency anemia on the fetus and neonate are unclear. In general, even with significant maternal iron deficiency, the fetus will receive adequate stores at a cost to the mother. If the mother is severely anemic, the fetus may have reduced RBC volume, hemoglobin, and iron stores. Profound maternal anemia can reduce fetal oxygen supply. Therapeutic management. Routine supplemental iron therapy, rather than therapy based on an indication of anemia, is controversial. Ferrous sulfate, 325 milligrams, which provides 60 to 65 milligrams of elemental iron, one to three times per day, is commonly prescribed. Many women experience less GI discomfort if iron supplementation is taken with meals, although absorption is less. Taking iron supplementation with vitamin C may enhance absorption. Therapy is often continued for about six months after the anemia has been corrected. Parenteral therapy may be necessary for the woman who cannot or will not take oral iron supplementation and is significantly anemic, but does not require a transfusion.